Very few issues in medieval history are more hotly debated than feudalism. It is something which is pretty hard to define and it gives scholars fits. So today I'm going to try to offer up a brief explanation of what it is and I will go ahead and leave the caveat that this will not be a perfect explanation and that if you want to really delve into the topic you'll have to do a considerable amount of reading on your own. I've always felt like the best way to approach the history of any given topic is to look at the roots and origins first. I think that is absolutely necessary for any further understanding. So when we look at feudalism, we see that it does have its origins in the Western Roman Empire. And if we look at the Western Roman Empire, we see that one of the storylines which connects the Western Roman Empire through the Dark Ages to the High Middle Ages is that a lot of Roman titles and institutions um, which were around in the Western Roman Empire were then privatized over the course of time. So, for instance, an old office like Dux, which was a military leader, became a duke. The old office of Comes, which was a lower um, military office under the Romans, became count. And rather than being appointed by the Roman imperial government, these people were now local nobles and they, they had entrenched power in the local land economy. And these positions became hereditary and they extended beyond the initial um, limitations of being either a military or civilian official and they basically just became landlords who then also held the political power in that region. And then by extension the people under them who were there became more or less beholden to them um, and beholden to them for the land that they used. So uh, that also sort of has its origin in the Diocletianic reforms where people were expected to take up the profession of their father to keep the state running. So in many ways feudalism is the further development and also degeneration of the Diocletianic reforms of the late Roman Empire. Hopefully that'll make sense. If not, then I suggest you uh, briefly read up on what the Diocletianic reforms were and then you might be able to see where I'm get it going with this. In a feudal system, what we have are a series of people who are connected to each other by oaths, and um, they are in a chain of command or hierarchy based on those oaths and on obligations. So to sort of uh, flesh it out, what you have is you have the king at the top. Below him you have various nobles. Usually these are the highest ranking nobles like dukes or people who are the most powerful. And then those nobles have smaller nobles under them. And under all of these people, there are serfs. Um, so there can be some serfs who are directly responsible to the king, but normally on this pyramid, we put them under all of the nobles because it makes it a little easier. Um, knights are within the noble category. The noble category is pretty broad, and it includes a lot of uh, various power levels, more than like a Dragon Ball Z episode. Uh, so you have everybody from dukes who are, you know, pretty much uh, almost on par with the king in some cases, and then you have knights sometimes who are don't even really own any land; they just have a title and a suit of armor and a horse. Um, and the main purpose of knights is not to slay dragons or engage in chivalry, but more or less to serve as enforcers or rena cops for the kings and the nobles. The church is a little bit more complicated. Um, obviously, um, a lot of church officials are responsible to the church at Rome rather than their local lord. There are other church officials who are more or less appointed and sustained by their local lords or the king. So that really throws another level of complexity in. Um, another wrinkle in this is that the church often would own certain lands and then farm them as if they were a noble landlord. So they would have serfs who are not in the church but who are... Um, sworn to them by an oath and are their vassals and serfs. Um, and another complex area of complexity is that most of the leadership from the church is drawn from the noble classes. So people who are extra sons who um, their fathers want to get rid of so they don't divide the estate too much go into the church and become bishops or other leaders, uh, you know, the abbots, things like that. And then um, lower class rank and file churchmen, like your average monks, those guys come from the lower classes of society, the you know serf classes. 
So um, this feudal hierarchy does impact how the church works, and in turn, because the church will own some of the land in any given place, um, it will in turn affect the local hierarchy. Um, you know, the church being both in and without it by being part of the kingdom and also part of the overall church from Rome. This provides all kinds of um, possible complexity. Hopefully this has been clear and not totally confusing. I apologize again if it was confusing. Above, I attempted to outline the basic organization of feudalism, and you saw that it really isn't all that basic. Well, now things are going to get a little bit more complex. Let's talk about how applicable the term feudalism is to areas in Europe other than France and Britain. Now, the model for feudalism that we use is drawn on evidence from Norman England and the Frankish areas of northern France. So basically, the home of Charlemagne's empire, and then the state set up by William the Conqueror in England. Um, and those areas actually practice feudalism in a way which is different than the rest of Europe. So the fact that the scholars who came from those areas wrote about feudalism first means that this model is basically describing those areas and then judging all of the rest of Europe on those standards which don't quite fit. Um, so if, even if we go to South France, things are a little different. Italy, things are a little different. The Holy Roman Empire, um, it's set up by the Franks, so you'd think it'd be more uniform. But as that um, country divides and subdivides and subdivides um, generation after generation, it becomes quite a bit different um, because the percentage of nobles will be so high for reasons I don't want to get into. Um, and because of all these complications, this term for feudalism has really come under fire and um, a lot of scholars have sought to replace it but no one has really been successful as of yet. Another potential source of confusion is that some people have tried to apply the term feudalism to the Byzantine Empire but that doesn't work because in the Byzantine Empire the landowner was always the state and never a local feudal lord. So for the sake of argument, let's forget about all of Europe outside of northern France and England and just look at those areas. So everything's fine and dandy, right? You have your king and then your various lords and then you have your serfs out there farming and everything's fine. All right, but it's more complicated than that. So just like there is a lot of variance among the nobles, you have everybody from the high lords down to the knights, there's also a lot of variance among the serfs. So some of these serfs are free peasants um, which means that they're not really bound by um, feudal obligations the same way that their neighbors are. And even among those who are bound, some of them are much better off than others. Some of them have skills, like they can uh, make beer or something like that. Um, or they simply are better at farming, um, so they live better off. Um, there's also a variance caused by the involvement of the Lord. Um, peasants were generally more free when their lords were more ambitious um, warrior wanderer types and would stay away from home and allow them to live their lives, you know, unharassed. Um, so there were some peasants who lived a pretty good life. Then there were others who were a little better off than slaves. It's really, there's a lot of variance there, and if anything, this variance is every bit as big, if not more so, than the variance between a lot of the lords. Um, and another major exception is that towns and cities generally govern themselves and are not actually subject to any lord other than the king. So um, there were plenty of internal conflicts between local lords and towns, especially in France, and usually the towns were able to hold out, and then the lords would have to make peace with the towns because they needed the towns to um, as places to serve as markets. So for the most part, the towns were independent of the feudal system, even though they also played a vital role in allowing the feudal economy to continue. Um, and eventually when the towns grow in size, um, they will really challenge feudal power. Also another interesting thing about towns and cities in the Middle Ages is that if you wanted to flee your land as a peasant or as a serf, that was your best option. Now technically it was illegal, and you can imagine who was um, all in favor of that law. But um, a lot of people managed to pull it off anyway, and they would go to a city or town and live there after living as a serf on some estate. 
Um, and that is one of the reasons why these towns and cities slowly started growing after about the year 800 is because of runaway serfs. Mostly, though, it was just from economic growth and natural population growth due to um, increased farming methods. And then those, of course, increased farming methods um, led to less land for farmers and they wanted to do something else, so they went to town. It all fed into each other eventually. Hopefully I haven't rambled on too long. I'm just going to end it right now. So we've already seen that feudalism has a lot of potential complications. Well, none of them was quite as politically impactful as the complication that there is no limit on how many people you can owe a feudal obligation to. So, for instance, you can have a different feudal relationship with one person than you do with another. If you're a great lord, you can be the lord of some people and then the serf of, or the vassal of others. Um, it is pretty complex. And if you're a lord on the border of two kingdoms, you can have obligations to both kingdoms that are at variance with one another and then can cause headaches in a time of crisis. Not to mention also in a time of administration. What if it's time to pay taxes and you have taxes to two people but you only have one realm? Well, that sucks. Um, now, let's talk about the um, ultimate classic example. So, in 1066, the Lord of Normandy, William the Bastard, invaded England, conquered it, became William the Conqueror. And now, he is both the Duke of Normandy, a vassal of the King of France, and he is the King of England. So this creates all kinds of complexity between um, William and the French kings of his time. Because now, on the one hand, they have to write to him as an equal in his capacity as the King of England, but he is also their vassal and pays them taxes in his capacity as the Duke of Normandy. Um, later on, the claims that um, the kings of England would have as the Dukes of Normandy to the French throne would become important and that was what led the English to attempt to conquer France in the Hundred Years War. Um, so these things can lead to major problems and um, a lot of these problems are not necessarily um, easily solved because they get naughty and nasty. Now in addition the Great Lords are relatively independent and this really makes the exercise of centralized royal power difficult um, both in terms of trying to do policy making, say reforming anything, and then enforcing anything that's already existent or that you're trying to pass. So one classic example of that is King John I of England, who um, was opposed at every turn by his nobles and had to fight them constantly. We'll talk about King John in due time. He's a pretty interesting guy, the younger and lesser brother of Richard the Lionheart. Um, and then because you have these entrenched noble interests, they are able and interested in holding back progress that they see as threatening, especially military innovations and urban development. Now obviously they don't control the towns, so they're against them developing, because once the towns develop you have alternate sources of wealth. Wealthy merchants can then compete with nobles on uh, various stages from everything from conspicuous display to patronage to all kinds of things. Military innovations, a lot of uh, English nobles were pretty miffed that the king started using um, peasant units of archers and things like that when they started to reform the army. And the ultimate example, though, of great feudal lords really holding back progress on purpose is in Spain. Um, part of the reason why Spain went from being a world power in the 1500s to being a backwater um, is that the nobles were intentionally regressive and they wanted to... Um, prevent change. And there is actually a famous quote that I can't quite remember where some noble was responding to a criticism by saying, you say that we're backwards, but I say that we're not backwards enough. Anyway, that is my presentation on feudalism. Hopefully this helps to clarify this really murky subject to at least a little small degree. Um, and now we can get back to things that are relatively easy to describe.